Ooh, I've got a special clicker. That's brilliant, look at that. Singapore has got technology. In, in, in York, you know, we're still using the whiteboards. Okay, great, so here's the overview of the talk. A little bit of background, uh, you know, why are, we, why are we trying to quantify the impact on health inequality? That, that's, that's the sort of big new thing, to quantify the impact on health inequality. That's, that's, that's what these methods are all about. Uh, and then some concepts and some examples uh, and some further reading at the end there. Um, Okay, so health inequality, uh, the one of the problems in this field is that there's so many different words for things which sort of mean the same thing. So the World Health Organization call this health inequities. And in the USA um, and North America, it's health disparities. In England, in my country, we talk about health inequalities. I think here in Asia, health inequalities is the word. Am I right? Well, whatever. Anyway, what we're talking about is unfair differences in health between more and less socially uh, disadvantaged groups, often by things like income and social status, but also by ethnicity. And there's a whole bunch of other indicators of social disadvantage. So it's sort of differences in health between groups uh, of, of people. Um, and even, I mean, even the definition is contested, by the way. There are, there are people who want to look at Economists who want to look at pure distributions of health, but I won't get into that. The, 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 what, when policymakers and public health people talk about health inequalities, that's what they mean, and that's what I mean when I'm talking in this in this talk. Um, and you know, the singular health inequality just means the, the overall scale of these problems, because obviously there's lots of different health inequalities, you know, between different groups of different kinds. Um, and it's important. I mean, I'll come back to that. It's important to measure the overall scale of problems if you want to compare the size of impact on health inequality between different diseases and different interventions across the whole health system, uh, you, you need a measure, a sort of generic measure of the scale of impact of, of, on health inequality. And it's, you know, it's very much like you know, boring old health economists like they've been saying for years and years, we need to use a quali, quality adjusted life year, or a DALI, disability adjusted life year. The reason we do that uh, is just because we can it allows us to compare the size of impacts on health across disease areas. That's why we do it. Um, it's not because we're stupid and we don't realize there are subtle differences in things. It's that, it's that we need a measure of the size of things uh, to help policymakers. Um, okay, and so then um, obviously there's a lot of policy concern about health inequality, uh, particularly since COVID, you know, obviously revealed and shone a spotlight on, on some of these inequalities. Uh, but it's a very long-standing problem. And in some places, in many places, it's, 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 it's widening. Interestingly, my, my reading of the data, well, I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you a picture. My reading, I mean, here's some data. This is, I'm afraid, this is OECD countries, mostly Western countries. Forgive me, I, I didn't really do my homework and look, because I'm sure there is good, good data on Asian countries. And we're going to be doing some work, actually, with colleagues uh, in HITAP in, in Thailand on... on uh, the social distribution of health in certainly in Thailand, and I'm sure we'll be doing it in other countries. I have a colleague who's done some work on India where there were quite big inequalities. But what really interests me in this picture, I mean, you know, there's a the usual picture, large differences in life expectancy. This is at age 25, uh, and this is between high and low educated people. They adjust the gradings, you know, between countries. So it's as comparable as you can get uh, in this field. Quite large differences, but look at look at Japan. It's really small, and that puzzles me. I still don't understand it. I've checked the data, not just this data set. There's other, you know, they've they've they've, they've used occupational class and so on. So Japan seems surprisingly small, given the high levels of income inequality in Japan. So that's a puzzle, and I'd be fascinated to see what happens in Singapore if we ever get around to looking at you know. So um, some some very interesting, possibly cultural differences. It might be a data artifact to do with um, how, because we're not using income at family level, we're using, well, here we're using education, um, which of course varies between countries in, in interesting ways. So let's not read too much into these differences. But basically, the, I mean, the main point I want to make is there's big inequalities, but there is variation, and maybe societies can do something about health inequality. They can reduce it um, by doing certain things. And anyway, so but there we are. So, that, so that's, that's a general picture of, of the problem. But you can draw these graphs you know, in, in all countries around the world. You can draw a graph with some indication of social status on the horizontal axis, some indication of health on the y-axis. And most of the time, you get a social gradient. 
not a steep, it's not like poor versus rich, it's a, it's a gradient, you know, for all sorts of measures. So it's a very, it's one of the most robust um, relationships in the whole of social science, this gradient. And the idea is, the idea of the methods that I'm uh, talking about today is to sort of shift that gradient in, in the right direction. Uh, and and by, by the way, it's about measuring the impact of all policies uh, on things so that we know when we're shifting it in the wrong direction. We want it to go that way, shallow. We don't want it to go that way, uh, steep. So it's important to uh, evaluate everything, not, not just things that we think are going to be good for health inequality. We need to w worry about things that are bad and maybe moderate those policies if, if, if we want to reduce these gaps. I mean, that, that's the big, you know, a big if here. Uh, and here's a picture for England um, and Wales, my country. Um, and here's a gap. Here, this time, we're not just measuring uh, life expectancy. We're, we're sort of adjusting for morbidity and uh, quality of life. And we get bigger gaps. When we adjust for morbidity, the gaps get even bigger because there's you know, differences in morbidity as well as mortality. So about 12 year gap between the richest and poorest fifth in my country. Um, and I just wanted to say that this word, it's back, back to language again, forgive me. Uh, this word equity means you know, lots of different things to different people. And in the context of cost effectiveness and health, certainly health technology assessment, but also wider appraisal of policies, um, it's important to distinguish two different uh, equity concerns. One is reducing health inequality, the one that I'm talking about, and the other is concern for current severity of illness. Um, and they're different. Well, they, they can point in the same direction, I mean, you know, um, but sometimes they're different. And so here's a little example here. Um, think about someone with late stage skin cancer, usually uh, older people, uh, get get these skin cancer and often uh, actually reasonably high social status um, because you have to um, be reasonably healthy to live long enough to get skin cancer right so it turns out that this population is actually reasonably well off in terms of certainly in terms of lifetime health uh, and in terms of uh, income uh, whereas um, and um, i'm comparing you know, imagine it's uh, imagine we're comparing that intervention with uh, screening for maternal depression you know, among newborns um, now, um, newborn babies are very healthy at the moment, right? They're not severely ill right now. So on the severity scale, zero, they're very healthy, right? But on the health inequality scale, if you know, a baby with a depressed mother maybe has some social problems in their life, maybe has risks of social problems and health problems throughout their life. So they, you know, they would count as sort of health inequality risk, let's say. So they'd be scored quite highly, as it were, on the health inequality um, scale. So anyway, so there you go, you've got a sort of trade-off there between two equity concerns. Do you, you know, imagine they're equally cost-effective, the same in every other respect, but just they differ in the severity versus health inequality. You have a dilemma there, which, which is, which ethically, which is more important? The patient who's suffering right now from skin cancer is elderly or the little baby. And it's really difficult ethical dilemma. I'm not going to say which is, which is the right decision. You, you decide, you know, decision maker decides. But the point is, they're different, <laughs> right? And, and so it's just important to have clear concepts here, what we're talking about when we're talking about equity. And in general, not always, but in general, severity of illness will tend to prioritize emergency and acute hospital care for older people with later stage diseases. They're the ones who are severely ill now, whereas health inequality tends to prioritize more primary and community care for children and working age adults with earlier, you know, or maybe no stage disease, but risk factors for developing over their life course problems. Not always, I absolutely hasten to add, this is, this is very general, but I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just distinguishing these two concerns. And another, con and you know, there's other equity concerns that are different. Right? For example, rarity of condition. We often worry about rare conditions, particularly when you can give a large benefit to someone. Um, and that's another ethical problem about, it's called the aggregation problem about giving, you know, do we give a large benefit to one person or lots of small benefits to, to millions of people? That's another ethical concern, which is again, different from health inequality. So anyway, I just wanna raise that because it, I, it sounds a bit um, geeky and philosophical, but it actually causes a lot of disputes and um, confusion. Um, okay. So why? So, so we're talking about health and quality now. Why do we want to quantify this? Why not just um, uh, be upset about it and talk about it um, and try to do what we know is the right thing to do? Great to do that. Great, great to raise problems and to be morally outraged about them. Um, but, you know, I'm an economist and I like to sort of, you know, set objectives and move towards them and so on. And so the thought is, 
if you quantify something, you've got more chance of bringing it to the attention of decision makers. And actually decision makers like that, they, they like to see numbers, they like to know what they're doing. And so quantification, even if you, you're not a numbers person, it's kind of useful um, to bring, not just to bring issues to people's attention, but to see what the, what the, what the solutions might be. And I think it's quite, it's quite important to realize, and so, so the, yeah, here's my little thing. This is my, you know, forgive me, I give this uh, talk all the time, this, this slide. Yeah, the idea is that we look at averages most of the time. Decision makers day to day, I mean, sometimes they, there's these big reports on health inequality, oh dear, how sad, but then they go back to the day job and the data is all averages, average costs, average benefits, average effects. It's all averages because that's you know, easier to do. Um, but then what we want to do is split those averages out into the distributions by whatever social groups matter to you in your country. Um, that's the idea here. Um, and the point is that it's moving away from just describing problems and towards evaluating solutions. That's the sort of big aim here. And, you know, if you look at the history of health services research, in a way, that's the movement, you know, in the old days, certainly in my bit of that in the economics, there was a lot of cost of illness studies and burden of disease. Fine, that's great and nice to shine a light on things. But, you know, ultimately you need to know what's the impact of an intervention on the cost? What's the impact of an intervention uh, on, on the burden of illness? What's the health, you know, the effectiveness of things? And here we're talking exactly the same thing. We're moving the health and the quality field away from just describing problems uh, towards evaluating solutions and, and the, the impact of decisions on changing these inequalities, presumably reducing them. So that's the point of this. Um, and how could this information be used? Well, potentially all over the place. So, I mean, I, you know, I sort of swim mostly in the health technology assessment field. So it's, you know, new technology, new medicines and, te and, and devices and technologies of you know, surgery, whatever. Um, but also public, you know, public health things, vaccinations, you know, there's all sorts of interesting across the health system uh, uh, technologies. Um, including old interventions that, you know, the, you know, the delivery and design of, of things. How, how do we make sure that interventions are getting to the right people? Um, but also, I think, um, you know, and then that will be interesting to, you know, to industry eventually. Well, the industry are interested in this, actually, but it's interesting to them in, in you know, when they're developing products, it's not, you know, it's not just about whether, whether it will benefit people in the average. It's just worrying about, given the infrastructure and the context of a society, how will this be distributed? Who will get access to this? new medicine, new technology, um, and can we redesign things to be a bit more convenient or useful for, for uh, more disadvantaged people, or, or can we worry about the infrastructure around that delivery infrastructure uh, when we're making these decisions? And of course, I think it's really important for wider decision making, you know, system level decision making and beyond, you know, I think, I think this sort of stuff can be useful, uh, you know, certainly in childhood policy, that's an area I've got interested in recently, but you know, wider social policy making to think about these, these health inequality impacts. So that's, um, that's the sort of vision for moving, moving these fields forward. Um, and um, let me just talk about some concepts now. I don't know if there's any questions coming up yet, but do, do pop questions into the chat, which I can come back to later if it's not directly relevant now. So if you've got, if you've got any question you want to ask me, just think about it and shove it in the chat. Um, right, okay, so far? <laughs> okay, key concepts. Um, so, um, Direction and magnitude of, of health inequality impacts. That's what we're trying to measure. And even the direction is not always obvious. So here's a little optical illusion for you. We think we know um, what's going on. We think we know the impact. We, we know this is going to be good for health inequality or bad. But sometimes we get it wrong because things are complicated. So here's, you know, these lines kind of look wonky. They're actually all, all parallel, but they look as though they're pointing in the wrong direction. Well, some of them look as though they're going up, some of them look as though they're going down. And that, it's like that, there's Liz a bit like that with health and equality impact. Sometimes we think it's obvious it's going to be good, but it might not be. And so I'll come to some examples of that. So that's why we need a bit of analysis and you know, evidence about these things. Um, and the re reason why it's complicated is this. So on the route to a health and equality impact, we've got at least four steps. <clears throat> um, the first is who receives the intervention the eligible population, basically the prevalence of the condition, um, which is very often socially patterned. So I don't know, smoking, for example, more disadvantaged people tend to smoke more. Okay, so that's, you know, in a sense, ooh, obvious that if you'd have a smoking intervention, of course, it's going to benefit poorer people, right? Because, because um, there's, there's more of them, the prevalence is higher in poorer groups, not necessarily, because then we've got the next step, which is uptake, who's actually going to use the intervention. 
So again, smoking cessation, who actually turns up to the smoking cessation clinic? Who, you know, um, and, then, and then you turn up, who then takes the patch or whatever it is and ca carries on and does the lifestyle change for, 30, well, for, for several months and gives up? Again, that's socially patterned in the other direction. Um, and then, and then you, the next step on the uh, staircase is effectiveness. What is the effect of this intervention? And actually, that can be complicated. So with smoking cessation, it's very complicated because you've got things working in different directions. So you've got poor, more disadvantaged people, got more, more comorbidities and maybe less time to live sort of thing. But then there's, there's competing risk. But then, you know, because they're more severe and they might be smoking at a higher rate, they might benefit more from stopping smoking. Um, so this, it's complicated. So we usually just assume it's equal across the strata. But if you did some fancy statistical modeling, and there's plenty of people in this building who could do that sort of thing, you might, you know, it might be, it might be more interesting than you think who gains more in terms of effectiveness. And then the final step on the staircase, which is really important, and of course, as an economist, I bang on about this all the time, who loses? When you spend money on thing A, you're taking money and resources from things B, C, D, E, F. We don't, we don't, we don't actually know what you're taking money away from, actually, usually. But it's, it's coming from somewhere. It, it might be higher prices, and it's coming from outside the health system. But that might, that might have effects on people if, 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 you have, if you consume less. So the point is, there's always an opportunity cost to everything, to everything financial, to everything to do with resources. Um, and the question is, who bears it? And usually we just assume it's flat across the social strata, but sometimes, you know, in fact, the latest evidence in my country is it's not, we, 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 we thought it was quite steep because utilization is much higher in socially disadvantaged groups. So we sort of, if, if you assume that all utilization gives the same benefit, then you get a very steep anti-disadvantaged distribution of opportunity. You know, if you're taking money out of the health system, that's bad for disadvantaged people. But it turns out in my country, it's not quite as steep as that because per pound spent or per, per unit of resource spent, you might get smaller benefits uh, in the more disadvantaged folk for various reasons, comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera you know, capacity to benefit, et cetera. Um, so, um, so at the moment, there's a lot of uncertainty, even with, you know, we, well, I wouldn't say we've done lots of research on this. We've been spending five years or so looking at these questions, but the, the, the jury is out as to how, we, we, we're pretty sure it's, anti-poor or anti-disadvantaged this distribution but we're not sure how steep it is um, and in different countries it can go the other way in some lower middle income countries it's the middle that gain most from public expenditure they're more likely to act you know you know metropolitan people living in urban areas gain more because you know rural areas gain less from public uh, spending for various reasons so anyway it's just you need to think about this who's going to lose when you take money away and you need to do some sensitivity analysis on different distributions just to check the, the uncertainty around around the health inequality impact. Anyway, as you can imagine, when you add up these four things, it's not clear which direction. It's not always clear. So with the smoking cessation, it's not always clear whether that's going to be pro or anti, poor or disadvantaged. Um, turns out in my country, it, overall, it did reduce health inequalities a bit, um, but it really depends on the uptake, and that is where the design of the intervention is crucial. How do you deliver your smoking cessation? How do you deliver your you know, vaccination program, etc., and it's all about you know who, who uh, the, the the clinics and who's who's getting into them and you know who, who, who's using things, and that's a that's an infrastructure uh, question. Okay, so that's why it's a bit complicated. Um, and oops, am I frozen again? Um, but the idea is you can do, yeah, some simple analysis at each of these steps and put it all together. And you can, you can do a fancy analysis of this, but you can do it in simple steps. And I'll, I'll talk about a simplified tool we'll develop later. But anyway, when you do all that calculation, you end up with a number, you end up with this impact on health inequality. You quantify the, the direction and the magnitude of effect on health inequality. And then you can plot that along the um, you know, horizontal axis there against the overall impact on health or the, or the, or the cost effectiveness on this axis. And you know, it's very simple. Which quadrant are you in with your intervention? Are you, are you in a win-win? Are you both improving health and uh, reducing health inequality? Are you in the red, you know, lose-lose, bad for both? Or are you in one of these trade-off quadrants, which some, you know, not every, you know, sometimes you get trade-offs. Often you're in one of these two. But you do sometimes get these trade-offs of both kinds. Sometimes it's you know, good for total population health, 
but bad for health inequality and vice versa. And the idea is not necessarily, I mean, you might decide, well, if, you know, if it's one of these trade-off you might say, well, we're not going to fund it then. Or you might say, well, yeah, we're going to fund it, but we're going to redesign it. Imagine you're in this quadrant. A lot of public health stuff is in this quadrant. More advantage, you know, particularly if you, if you need behavior change uh, as part of your um, uh, intervention, then you're off, you know, you, you, you may well end up in this kind of quadrant, really cost-effective, but, but actually widening inequalities because it's the more advantaged people who can take advantage of, of uh, behavior change things. Um, and so you might want to redesign the delivery of your intervention to shift you a bit closer to the win-win. Um, and then, you know, you, then you can evaluate your, your kind of your redesigned pro-equity delivery version of your policy, if it's a vaccination or screening, whatever it is, and you can decide whether, whether the additional costs of the redesigned policy are worth those equity benefits. And again, that's up to the decision maker what their trade-offs are. It's not, it's not up to the analyst, but we can at least give some quantitative clue about the nature of those trade-offs, which could be useful. Um, or at least knowing where you are in the quadrant. I mean, most of the time, decision makers have some idea of this dimension, but they really have, or they, they think they, as I said, they think they know this dimension, right? But as, as I said, the optical illusion, they may, they may well be wrong. And they certainly don't know the magnitude. They have no idea how big <clears throat> uh, effect they're having compared with other effects of other policies. Um, and just to bang on about that point a little bit more, a generic health inequality impact, we usually measure it in terms of um, differences in social groups uh, on, on quality adjusted life expectancy. So that's quite a broad general lifetime measure of health. You could do it in terms of life expectancy. I mean, you, you, you could measure these things in terms of you know, numbers of infant deaths or whatever your specific um, uh, disease measure is. But better to do a, have a broader measure so that you can compare impact between, <clears throat> between uh, different interventions. And how to set up your social grouping will really depend on your country and your data. Um, typically, most countries have some sort of postcode based deprivation index, which roughly splits the world into five um, equally sized social groups, but it's complicated and, 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 and it varies between country and often it's ethnicity of some sort, uh, some ethnic category that's important in, in, in countries, or rural, urban, it's the other one that comes up a lot. And of course, gender, gender can be, you know, but what, you know, whatever you're interested in, whatever social division you're interested in, you know, you can create these groups and, de and develop, a, um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'd call it just a generic social classification index that you would apply to different decisions in order to get a bit of consistency uh, between them. So that's the idea. And of course, you're never going to cover everything. Any, any tractably small set of groups, five groups, 10 groups, however many groups. In, in, in the USA, we're up to 25 ethnic social groups. You know, however many, you know, you, you, can, you, know, um, you, you can have more and more groups, but in a sense, um, if it's tractable and measurable in a sensible way without very small numbers in certain groups, you're going to make compromises. You're never going to be perfect. But a lot of the time, these things are correlated, you know, the ethnic, <clears throat> disadvantages are correlated usually with the socioeconomic. Not always, okay, sure, it's, it's complicated. But, um, you know, this is not a bad starting point, just, just looking at the socioeconomic, um, and, then, and then you can layer on other things when, when, they're, when they're important. Well, that's that, um, and various countries are developing these systems now, and, and, and you know, it, it does vary, it does vary between countries. Um, okay, with... Everyone's pretty, everyone's doing their emails. What are they doing? Um, all right. Um, uh, so designing an analy analysis, um, I mean, it's quite important to, you know, think this through at the beginning of a, of a study, you know, um, what you're doing, what your purpose is, what, what kinds, you know, basically, what is your baseline distribution of health? What is your social classification index? Which, you know, what do you mean by health inequality? Which social groups are you talking about? What's your metric? Um, so, you, you know, you start with that. What's the, what's the basic health inequality I'm trying to reduce? And then you have to think about, well, you know, what are the, what's the distribution of benefits along that social strata? But crucially, what's the distribution of opportunity costs as well? Don't forget that bit. If you want to do a, you want to do a cost effect, if you want to think like an economist, you've got to worry about the op, op costs as well as the benefits. And then you put them together into the final distribution. And then you compare. You compare the final distribution with and without the treatment or whatever it is you're doing. You might have several interventions. You, 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 all you're doing is then evaluate, you know, you first of all, basically you simulate the distribution and then you evaluate it, really simple um, in, in theory. 
And then there's various ways of evaluating distributions. There's equity weights, one approach, where you could just visually look at it, just look at those bar charts. That's, that's often enough. Um, but sometimes the, the, the bars go in funny ways, so you need to do a bit more formal analysis. Uh, and there's various indices of inequality that you could use depending on, um, you know, you, uh, yeah, depending on, your, on, on what you think is useful. The problem with a lot of these indices is they're very complicated. No one understands what a Gini is, let alone what a concentration index or a Kekwan, it would have, you know, the list goes on, Atkinson index and so on. Uh, and often decision makers get confused, in my experience, get confused by these indices. So I tend to simplify things. I use very simple gap measures or sl slope index, basically a gap between the top and bottom group. That, that's, that's, a, that's probably as complicated as you need to get, actually. Um, and then you, can, then you can measure, you know, you can measure the gap in terms of qualities or healthy years. And, you know, then you can have a reasonably simple metric of are you increasing or reducing that gap? And, and anyway, so that's an ongoing area of research, actually, how to communicate this information to decision makers, because it's a little bit more complicated than averages when you talk about inequalities. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, and, you know, you can, you can choose your index to give you the result you want. There's a, there's a risk of that. OK, um, so what are the key inputs into doing this? Um, the first thing is your baseline. You, know, you basically, you know, what is your health inequality? What is your baseline distribution of health? Um, by these social groups. So there's a whole bunch of decisions to be made there about setting up your group, your, your sort of generic social classification index uh, and your generic measure of, of health. So once you've got that set up, then you can, I mean, that's your baseline. And then you, you, know, you do that once and then you can do lots of studies using the same uh, generic baseline. So in a way, that's, that's a nice, well, that's, it's, it's hard work to get there. Once you've got that basic uh, uh, plank or, um, uh, building block of BCA, then, then you can zoom ahead doing this, looking at the social distribution of effects of your specific intervention. Um, and then here's another sort of plank or um, building block that needs to be worked out. What is the social distribution of health opportunity cost? And that will depend on not only which country you're in, but which, which provide, which, which delivery system. So in my country, you've only got one system, really, the NHS, National Health Service, but in many countries, you've got different insurance systems, you know, and so the opportunity cost distribution might depend on which payer you're talking about. And it certainly depends on whether you're talking about a healthcare intervention, or let's say if it could be a, a government expenditure, local government, a welfare expenditure. It's like, you know, different systems have different um, uh, 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 financial implications and, and, and opportunity cost implications. So you have to worry a little bit about that. Um, yeah. Um, off, off, so, for example, in my you know, social care and often local government expenditure in my country tends to be more pro poor because um, you know, there's a lot of children's care and adult social care, which tends to be very steeply socially patterned. So, often I would have thought, I uh, haven't measured it, but my instinct would be that in, in local governments, you'd have a steeper anti poor or pro poor distribution of opportunity costs um, the, the, than, in, than in healthcare. But, you know, one would have to think about these things and, and analyze them. Um, and then finally, the final piece of the picture, you don't actually need this. Um, you can you know, this is the inequality aversion, how much you care about health inequality versus improving health. You don't act, you, you, you decision maker can evolve that. I mean, in, in my field of health economics, there's a, you know, there's a thing called the threshold, the cost effectiveness threshold, right? Again, this is a sort of magic number that evolves over time as decision makers uh, make decisions. So, you, you know, you can, you can just do it that way. What, you know, whatever the decision maker, you know, they make a decision and that will imply a particular um, degree of health inequality aversion. So you can sort of evolve that over time or you can do surveys of the public to see what the public think. And we've done some of these surveys in various countries now, uh, typically finding quite high, actually, quite high degrees of health inequality aversion. When you ask people, um, you know, you, you, you end up with quite high trade-offs. You know, people are willing to, you know, at least in my country and many European countries, to, to um, trade off quite large amounts of total health in order to reduce health inequalities. At least that's what they say in surveys. Whether they behave like that in their lives, you know, who knows? Um, uh, and, but that, again, that's a nice, very interesting ongoing area of research. Uh, what do the public really think about these, about these trade-offs? So that's the, that's the basic setup. And here's just an example of sensitivity analysis you can do on the opportunity costs. And what, all I want to say, I mean, it looks like it's an absolute mess. It could go in any direction, which is probably true. Well, except not quite. I don't think it can go in this, at least in my country, it doesn't go in this direction. It's not, it's not going to be a pro-rich 
Not that, that wealthier people gain more per pound of NHS spending than poorer people. We've never found that in any of our regressions and studies, but we have found all of these other patterns. Well, no, we, we haven't found this curvy pattern either. The curvy pattern, this is because we were doing it in Ethiopia. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a some people say, oh, well, it's all the, the, the middle people who gain the most from health spending in Ethiopia. So that's why we did that sensitivity. And it was just a check. Um, it was a rotavirus intervention, this particular thing. It was just a check. If you change the opportunity cost assumptions, does that change the direction and magnitude of your health inequality impact? In this case, I don't think it did. I think it was pretty robust to a lot of these assumptions, but sometimes it will really matter. And it's just important to know, it's important to be honest with decision makers, the uncertainty <coughs> around these estimates. If you don't know the impact, you don't know, you know, but sometimes you do know and it's important and it's worth knowing. So, sorry, I've rabbited on too long. Hooray. Yeah, well, there's a huge uncertainty about what's important, but I mean, you have to, you have to talk to the decision makers. It's really there. You, well, you have to even talk to the public as well. But you know, the decision maker really is, in a way, the customer of this. And and you know, what what are they concerned about? And you know, sometimes, yeah, different countries. Different. I mean, it's politics as well. This is quite political. So really, it's depend. You know, what the decision makers think is the important health inequality. We can provide data to help them. Um, but it does depend also, it's, it's, it's partly the values of the decision maker, but also partly the, the data availability. And, and there's often compromises, as I was saying. When is it most useful? Well, I kind of take the view it should be done, a simple version of this should be done like almost always. Um, just to check, just to check. I, I would call it a triaging approach. Do you think, wait, okay, I'll go back to the, um, whoop, go back to the, there we are. Triage it, do a little simple bit of analysis half a day, a couple of hours on, on a simple tool, do we think there's going to be a large positive or, you know, do we think we're going to be here or here quickly? And do we think it's going to be large and important? It, it basically, if we think it's really uncertain or it's really small, fine, throw it away, don't bother. But if we think we might be really improving health inequality or we might be really harming it, then and and you know and, and there's a reasonable degree of probability there then it's worth really checking and estimating and working out the magnitudes but if we if we're kind of here and not really sure then fine don't bother that would be my view a triaging approach but 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 you need to set up the simple tool to enable you to quickly make those um, judgments because it's not it's not quite enough just to rely on your intuition you need i think you need a little bit of analysis little, you know what is the social patterning of the disease some basic data so, um, so examples, some examples. So here's, sorry, it's English examples. Um, we do have, you know, it has been used. I mean, certainly a version. So this is very similar to what's called ex uh, extended cost effectiveness analysis. But then that's another terminological thing. Basically the same thing. It's about splitting things into distributions. It's just a different, different, you know, York calls it distributional, Harvard calls it extended. We all have our brand names, but whatever. I mean, you know, the reason I like the word distributional is because it's about distributions, you know, whereas extended was about extending not only in distributions, but in financial risk protection. Now, you can do distributions of financial risk protection as well. So um, anyway, let's not worry about terminology. But anyway, so here's a couple of English examples. First one is a sort of public healthy thing, lung health checks, healthcare public health, lung health checks for adults, uh, you know, 55 to 75 at risk of lung cancer, mostly smokers, but there's various other risk factors. So um, there's been a few trials of this, and um, you know you might think this is obviously going to uh, improve health inequality. What could be more socially patterned than lung cancer? Because poorer people tend to smoke more, at least in uh, you know the setting that we're talking about here in England. And um, you know obviously this is going to reduce health inequality, right? Uh, wrong. <laughs> Who turns up for the health check, do you think? And then who takes action as a result of the, of the findings? So it turns out that, so here's, um, here's the problem. When you send these invitations to the lung screening, even though this group here, I am the, the most disadvantaged lot, have got a higher prevalence, they're at higher risk of this, they're less likely to turn up. That's the problem. And so actually, if you deliver this intervention in the standard way, you know, you send a letter to someone, please turn up to a screening uh, 
session. Who to, you know, you, you end up increasing health inequality. So here are the numbers. That's the, that's the um, um, people who turn up. Um, here's your health losses. Don't forget your health losses, right? You're spending money on these health checks. You're not spending money on other things. So you've got some losses. Overall, we're estimating here that the poorest groups actually lose out health, right? Because you're taking money away from other things that would have benefited them more and the more advantaged gain more. So you're not doing much for health inequality with this intervention. Highly cost-effective, by the way. So if we plot it, there it is. It's in the sort of uh, win-lose quadrant. So it's cost-effective, not highly, quite cost-effective by public health standards. 20, in my country, 20,000 um, pounds per quality is the sort of public health threshold usually used. Um, quite reasonably cost-effective, depending on assumptions, but, but, it, but clearly uh, harming health inequality. So do we, do we say, oh, we're not going to do that then? No, we say, well, great idea, let's still do this, but let's redesign it so that we get the checks done um, in more disadvantaged populations. How do we do that? Well, they're piloting various things. They're, they're, starting, they're, they're putting vans, lung health check vans, into supermarket car parks in the poorer areas, you know, social marketing campaigns, et cetera. So they, you know, it's more expensive to do that. I mean, sending a letter and getting the person to travel to the hospital clinic or whatever the, you know, is, is relatively cheap. Sending people out in a van is costly of time. And so you, there's a trade-off there. Do you bother doing that in order to reduce health inequalities or, or not? So you know, do you do the sort of what we call the proportional universal pro-equity delivery, or do you just do the ordinary delivery? Um, you know, and then you can evaluate that on the same plane as this. Um, these trials are in progress, so I haven't done that yet, but that, you know, we'll, we'll be doing that in due course. So that's the kind of idea. Um, uh, yeah. And yeah, and then you can measure this. So you, you can put numbers on these things. That's the, that was the magnitude uh, of, of, the, of the effects on this. I won't go into the, those details. Here's another example. Um, this is uh, a, a National Institute for um, Care Excellence in my country, Health and Care Excellence thing. Uh, and um, this was uh, sickle cell uh, intervention, um, Krizan Lizumab. And um, I've retrospectively, they made the decision, I've gone back to, to the published data. They didn't, a lot of it's commercial incompetence uh, in this case. So I didn't actually know what the real numbers were. So I kind of made some educated guesses about the costs and so on. Um, but basically, what they did was they, 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 they recommended in favor of this intervention. It wasn't cost effective by the normal standards above 30,000. I, I don't even know roughly, you know, I imagine it was around the 50 to 60,000, you know, quite expensive. Um, but um, clearly reducing health inequality because it's, it's a sickle cell crisis was, was, you know, something that happens in, more, in certain minority ethnic populations. And the, 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 uh, the, the panel thought, well, that's important. We're going to be more generous in this case. And they said so. So that was a clear case of actually taking into account health inequality concerns. Now, they didn't have any data on, on this. I'm not even sure they had specific, they, they, had, they, they, had, I mean, they knew, and it's true that it's patterned by ethnicity. That's for sure. They had data on that. But I don't think they, they didn't calculate the actual impacts on things. But I've retrospectively gone through, not, this is not ethnicity. This is social deprivation. But it's absolutely <laughs> clear when you look at the patterning of prevalence of this condition not only is it ethnically patterned it's massively socially patterned so the correlation is very high in this in this case so it's kind of you know and there's no access and uptake issue here this, this is I mean, you know if you're in a real crisis you you know these, these these poor kids need 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 the treatment right there and they're there so there's no uptake issue here so when you do the mass of this you know, it's very clear. It, 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 I mean, you know, it's quite a simple piece of analysis. It just follows the same pattern. So you end up now because it's so expensive, <laughs> right? We've got very high opportunity costs. So don't forget, you know, yes, you're treating these very badly off kids and you're giving them wonderful life changing benefits, but you are taking health away from other people um, to do that. So overall, you know, utilitarian cost effectiveness calculation, you're losing, but you're certainly losing more from the more advantaged. So, um, group. So you're, you're basically your health inequality impact here is, is clearly positive, uh, even though it's not quite cost effective. So, you know, in a way, I mean, I'm, you know, whether the committee would have wanted to see this graph and to, and to know uh, on the numbers that they're reducing in health inequality, I don't know. When I talk to public health people, they do want to see these kinds of graphs. Um, anyway, so there you are. So that's an example of, um, of how you can put numbers on things. And an example of how nice kind of 
actually made a decision that you know, wasn't on the normal cost effectiveness lines, but did take into account health and quality. So decision makers you know, are starting to um, tweak things. Yeah, basically, that, those are some examples. And we have this, I, just want to, I, want to, I won't talk about the end. This is the questionnaire we use. You can look at this yourselves. The questionnaire, a hypothetical questionnaire about the trade-offs. Let me just show you this. So this is, here we go, it's just English data, hospital episode statistics data um, on prevalence of diseases by ICD-10 ICD code. And we, you know, have a little, if you're interested in this, have a little look at this. I mean, it's just, just, just the English context, but it gives you a very quick and easy way of seeing which quadrant you're in of the cost effectiveness plan. If, if you've done a basic cost effectiveness study, you can shove in your cost and effects, shove in your ICD-10 code, and think about whether there are uptake differentials and pl plug in your own guesses about that. And it'll give you a estimate of the direction and impact, and the direction and magnitude of impact. And you know, there you are, you've, you've got your half, half, you know, quick and easy estimate where you're in. And that's your, that's, that's your triage tool, whether you need to do further analysis. So I think this, this kind of calculator could be produced you know, for any country really, uh, so that you could quickly um, uh, have a guess as to which direction whether it's worth doing a more detailed analysis. Um, and for that, you know, you need, basically it's mainly prevalence. Can you estimate the social distribution of prevalence of conditions? If you've got reasonably good hospital data on the diagnosis or better still primary care data on these things, then you, you can do these things. It depends on the country. Um, and then there's various reading. This is a reasonably short editorial uh, about DCEA. Uh, and there's a special interest group uh, an ISPO, that's the Pharma Pharmacoeconomic Society, industry folk, and there's also um, an IHEA one, the International Health Economics Association. Um, so there's sort of growing international interest in this. And here's the sort of handbook of, of, of methods. And there's some example, there's some uh, spreadsheet training exercises. And we're going to start running courses, online courses from this autumn. 